Hello and welcome to our new video. In this video, we are going to discuss a very important topic that is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. In this video, we are going to discuss the clinical features, diagnostic criteria, laboratory studies, differential diagnosis, and management of antiphospholipid syndrome. So, what is antiphospholipid syndrome? Antiphospholipid syndrome is basically a condition in which the antibodies develop again against the vascular endothelial cells and platelets, which result in vasoconstriction thrombosis, placental infarction, and placental losses. There are a lot of terms used for antiphospholipid syndrome. For example, Hughes syndrome, anticardiolipine syndrome, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, or lupus anticoagulant syndrome. But this term is misleading because antiphospholipid syndrome may not have ACLE and it is associated with thrombosis rather than hemorrhagic complications. Antiphospholipid syndrome is currently the preferred term. Nowadays, we classify it as antiphospholipid syndrome with or without associated autoimmune rheumatic diseases. Antiphospholipid syndrome primarily present as recurrent venous or arterial thrombosis and or complications of pregnancy, recurrent fetal losses plus characteristics lab abnormalities. Due to the wide range of clinical manifestation and range of associated antibodies, auto antibodies in 2006, revised criteria for the diagnosis of antiphospholipid syndrome were published in international consensus statement. According to this criteria, at least one clinical criteria and one laboratory criteria must be present for a patient to be classified as having antiphospholipid syndrome. So let's discuss the diagnostic criteria. In this diagnostic criteria, there must be one at least one clinical plus at least one laboratory criteria for the diagnosis of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. In the clinical criteria, we look for vascular thrombotic event or pregnancy associated morbidity and complication. And in the clinical in the laboratory criteria, we look for three antibodies that are anti cardiolipine antibody, anti beta 2 glycoprotein 1 antibody, and lupus anticoagulant. So this is the diagnostic criteria. And at least one of the clinical plus one of the Laboratory criteria must be present for the diagnosis of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Now let's discuss this criteria and the clinical features along with the laboratory findings in detail. So, thrombotic events. As we say in the clinical criteria, there must be recurrent thrombosis. And this may occur in either arterial or venous circulation. Deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism and cerebrovascular accidents are typical clinical events. But other than this, but Chiari syndrome, cerebral sinus, vein thrombosis, myocardial or digital infarction, hemorrhagic infarction of the adrenal glands due to adrenal vein thrombosis and other thrombotic events also occur. So all of these thrombotic events may be present. Now let's discuss the pregnancy associated comorbidities. These are three points we have to look for. If they are, one of them is present, then we can say that the pregnancy associated morbidity is there. Number one. Death of a normal fetus after 10 weeks of gestation or premature birth before 34 weeks due to preeclampsia or greater than 3 consecutive abortions. If any of this is present, then we can suspect antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and along with the positive antibodies, then we can confirm the diagnosis. But other than vascular thrombotic events and those related with the pregnancy, there are some additional clinical features not included in the criteria. but associated with the antiphospholipid syndrome. There are cardiac vulgar diseases, levator reticularis, thrombocytopenia, nephropathy, and neurologic manifestation other than vascular thrombotic events. So these other additional clinical features may also be present other than vascular thrombotic or pregnancy associated complications. So any if any of the following clinical features is present, then we have to look for and work for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. In addition, in addition to the clinical criteria listed, at least one of the following laboratory criteria is necessary for the classification of antiphospholipid syndrome. The laboratory criteria include anticardiolipine antibody, IgG or IgM, anti beta 2 glycoprotein 1 antibody, or lupus anticoagulant on at least two occasions and at least 12 weeks apart. So, one of the criteria must be present for diagnosis of antiphospholipid syndrome. All of the three may also be positive, but at least one is required. These three antibodies are lupus anticoagulant antibody, 
एंटीकार्डियोलाइपिन आई और आई एंटीबॉडी एंड ल्यूपस एंटीकोगुलन एंटीबॉडी सॉरी एंटीबीटा टू ग्लाइको प्रोटीन वन एंटीबॉडी सो इन समरी फॉलोइंग लेबोरेटरी टेस्ट मस्ट बी डन फॉर द डायग्नोसिस ऑफ एंटी पॉस्पोलिपिट एंटीबॉडी सिंड्रोम दीज आर एंटीकार्डियोलाइपिन एंटीबॉडीज एंटीबीटा टू ग्लाइको प्रोटीन वन एंटीबॉडी एक्टिवेटेड पर्शल थ्रोम्बोप्लास्टीन टाइम ल्यूपस एंटीकोगुलन टेस्ट सीरोलॉजिक टेस्ट फॉर सेफिलिस कंप्लीट ब्लड काउंट एंड ए एन In the following condition, false positive result may come. Now let's discuss some of the differential diagnosis of antipospolipid syndrome that we have to look for. This thrombotic condition like DIC, infective endocarditis, thrombotic thrombocytic phenic perfora, and other than this, like heparin induced thrombocytopenia (PNH) or some acquired prothrombotic disorders like factor V played in mutation protein C and protein S deficiency or other condition like pregnancy and postpartum major surgery obesity malignancy heart failure nephrotic syndrome all of these conditions should be ruled out before diagnosing antipospolipid antibody syndrome so now let's discuss the treatment of aps as there is the main concern about thrombosis so the main state treatment is anticoagulation how we are going to anticoagulate let's discuss this we have to start anticoagulation with iv or subcutaneous heparin followed by warfarin therapy if there is thrombotic event along with the positive antibodies based on the most recent evidence the target of anr is for venous thrombosis 2 to 3 for arterial thrombosis up to 3 and recurrent thrombotic events may require from 3 to 4 anr severe refractory cases we can use combination of aspirin along with warfarin and treatment is generally lifelong so the main stay is anticoagulation in which we give heparin followed by warfarin once we achieve the target inr and the target inr is 2 to 3 for venous thrombosis up to 3 for arterial thrombosis and 3 to 4 for recurrent thrombosis but in pregnancy in pregnancy we have to use low molecular weight heparin warfarin is contraindicated in pregnancy but safe in breastfeeding if there is no history of thrombosis prior to pregnancy then we have to use prophylactic anticoagulation but if there is history of thrombosis outside the pregnancy then we have to use full therapeutic anticoagulation during pregnancy now let's discuss another important entity that is catastrophic antipospolipid syndrome catastrophic antipospolipid syndrome is rare affecting less than 1% of those with antipospolipid syndrome it is also called eschersen syndrome these patients are generally ill often with active sle and there is widespread thrombosis in several vascular blood and several vascular beds along with multi organ failure due to microvascular thrombotic ongoing activity that is called catastrophic antipospolipid syndrome and in this we have to give intensive anticoagulation in the treatment along with the plasma exchange we also give anti uh, corticosteroids and iv ig if there is a plasma exchange is not available so what are the take home messages take home messages are that if there is diagnosis of antipospolipid syndrome we have to initiate treatment with heparin and also start warfarin we have to stop heparin when therapeutic inr is achieved if the patient are asymptomatic then no treatment is required if there is venous thrombosis we use warfarin along with dinar inr our target inr is 2 to 3 if there is arterial thrombosis we use warfarin and the target inr is 3 if there are recurrent thrombosis then we use warfarin and the target inr is 3 to 4 we may also use aspirin but if there is catastrophic antipospolipid syndrome then we have to use full anticoagulation along with corticosteroid and along with that plasma exchange for intravenous immunoglobulins in pregnancy if the patient is asymptomatic then no treatment is required but if there is single loss then also no treatment is required but if recurrent loss then we have to use prophylactic dose of heparin along with aspirin up to 6 to 12 weeks postpartum if there is recurrent loss plus thrombosis then we have to give therapeutic heparin dose along with that aspirin and postpartum followed by warfarin warfarin if there is prior thrombosis then we have to give therapeutic heparin plus warfarin and followed by plus aspirin followed by warfarin postpartum and as we have said that in 20% of patient there may be mild thrombocytopenia and if that is mild then we have no treatment is required for that but if it is less than 50000 then we can give corticosteroid If still resistant, then hydroxychloroquine, intravenous immunoglobulin, or immunosuppressive therapy or splenectomy may be done. So, due to the wide spectrum of manifestation, any clinic clinician may encounter patient with APS 
This is potentially treatable condition. The best treatment at present to prevent recurrent thrombosis is anticoagulation and the optimal duration and intensity is controversial.